Hello and welcome to another Knee Guru webinar. Um, the topic of this webinar is knee meniscus substitution uh, and it was recorded on Wednesday the 1st of July in 2020. Um, we're very fortunate here to have two genuine world experts in the field of meniscus surgery and complex meniscus reconstructions. Uh, they are Professor Tim Spaulding and um, Professor Peter Vadunk. Um, and uh, Mr. Spaulding and Professor Vadunk have uh, led a lot of the research into um, how to manage uh, a severely damaged meniscus, whether that's um, replacing the damaged portion with a scaffold, whether it's using a donated meniscus, or now whether it's a complete meniscus replacement in the form of the new surface implant, um, which is discussed later on in this um, seminar. So um, there's a mix of questions at the end. We, we had a, a good number of people attend the webinar live and, and some of these were patients, some of these were surgeons um, and the patients had some specific problems about their condition, which I'm sure would relate to a lot of the people that are watching this and they're able to get some really good advice from uh, Mr. Spaulding and Professor Vadonk. Uh, and also clinicians who are asking in more general terms, you know, who is the ideal patient for a meniscus replacement and who is the ideal patient for a meniscus scaffold. So uh, these questions come at the end. I'm going to hand over to Mr. Tim Spaulding, who's going to talk around the, the problems that surgeons have with um, uh, these, these complex meniscal issues. Um, and then he hands over to Professor Vadonk for a more detailed talk through. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, there's the opportunity to download uh, a handout at the end. So there's two handouts actually. There's um, the uh, brochure for the new surface implant itself. And if you're from the UK, we've got a list of uh, UK clinicians who've been trained on the new surface implant um, and are able to implant it uh, on the NHS or, or privately. Um, so if you're a patient in the UK and, and you'd like to speak with somebody about whether this might be appropriate for yourself, then you can do so um, by contacting your local centre. Thank you very much and thanks for that introduction and let me just go right back to the beginning here of our little talk. Um, so I'm Tim Spaulding and I will be introducing Professor Peter Vadonk from Antwerp in Belgium and I really appreciate everyone's time in joining tonight. Uh, so I'm in uh, Coventry and then my whole specialist area of interest is in knee injuries and the challenging problems essentially of the, of the worn knee. And as you're going to hear tonight, we're all about knee meniscus substitution. The meniscus really is a key protection in the, in the knee, and it's something that we've been working on for many years and trying to help patients with the treatment and understanding their, their knee. And essentially, when managing the worn knee, we have our, our ladder of treatment for, for help. And that starts with the self-management aspects of looking after the knee, uh, adapting lifestyle to cope with the knee. And then we have our medical treatment and the physiotherapy options, as you can see on the second box up from the bottom as we approach towards the operation top of the ladder treatment. So in the medical treatment, we have the physio and braces and anti-inflammatories and then some of the injections to help with the knee pain. And then we get to the operations from arthroscopy, tidying up torn meniscus, and then the bit we're going to be focusing on tonight essentially is this bit at the top there, reconstructing the meniscus and essentially using substitutes to rebuild the meniscus and provide that cushioning in the knee, hopefully delaying and helping the knee before we get eventually to knee replacement for the very worn knee when we're down to bone on bone. So that is essentially is our way of, of handling the problem knee. And tonight we really want to focus on this um, uh, substitute bit. We'll see this diagram again, but essentially the meniscus acts as this cushion in the knee, making it as a C-shaped structure, taking the weight between the thigh bone at the top and then the arrow is where the meniscus is and the tibia at the bottom. And it makes a socket for the um, femur, the thigh bone to roll in, and it provides the hoop stress, the, the force to then control the loading through the knee. So without it, we get this peak loading, as you can see at the bottom of the picture on the right because the meniscus shares that load. And when we haven't got the meniscus, then we're in more trouble because the femur is taking all the weight on the tibia. And that's where we run into trouble. So we're looking for the option to rebuild the meniscus. Along the bottom, when you tear the meniscus, we have an option of repairing it using sutures. In the traumatic tear in the sporting person who tears the meniscus, that's a very good option for certain types of tear. 
Small fragments can be uh, removed, small tears is trimming away, still leaving enough of the meniscus in place. And then when the meniscus is gone and not there, then we have options to replace it, either using meniscus transplant, which is donor meniscus, or then the focus tonight is the substitute meniscus. So really with that introduction, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce Peter Vodonka. I've worked with him for many years and it's fantastic to see him here tonight with his great knowledge of the world of meniscus and meniscus substitution. So uh, welcome, Peter, and look forward to hearing your talk on the meniscus substitution. Thank you. I think the meniscus substitution is, is uh, one of those topics that is evolving rapidly, giving us new options for patients with sometimes very catastrophic injuries to the medial meniscus. That's what we're going to cover tonight. I'll try to move on with my slides. So basically, Tim already told you what the meniscus is. It's, it's a cushion that is situated between the, uh, the femur, the thigh bone, and the shin bone. It's C-shaped on the medial side. And basically, every knee has uh, two of these, one on the lateral side and one on the medial side. Tonight, we'll focus on the medial side because there is an option now to treat patients that have lost the medial meniscus or a significant part of the medial meniscus with this new device, which is called the new surface. It's basically uh, a plug and play insertion of a new meniscus on the medial side when it's lost. Uh, meniscus injuries are quite common, and I do guess that many of the patients that are online uh, today do have issues with lost meniscus tissue. The slide here says that most often these uh, menisci tear with a forceful twist or rotation of the knee, but very often the injuries are more kind of degenerative that it means that people very often start tearing their meniscus once they pass the age of 50 or 45 50 and basically those are not very forceful or very traumatic injuries they have a minor onset meaning that they have a, a twisting injury getting out of the car and basically many of these patients will cope with this kind of injury but sometimes this injury becomes too bad, too symptomatic, keeps on having pain or a clicking situation or a swelling of the knee, and that's when the surgeon has to act. So you can see on this slide that the injury rate is very high. There's about 18 million people per year that have this kind of injury on the knee uh, in the US, and of those, a significant part uh, has a meniscus injury, 2.5 million people in the US. I think worldwide that should cover close to four or five million in the Western world having this type of injury uh, on a yearly basis. So that's a huge number of patients that suffer the injury. And of that significant number, a minority, and we estimate five to 10% of these patients really run into trouble and need a substitution. As Tim already explained, we can, ex we can treat most of these patients conservatively uh, with non-surgical options. A number of them will end up with an arthroscopy, either a repair or a partial meniscectomy. And then a number of those patients will end up with still having troubles, still having issues. And in those cases, we need to put back into that knee a piece of meniscus, an allograft, a scaffold, or uh, this new device. Uh, what is the basic function of the meniscus? It has many functions, but basically it's a weight distributor. It also has on the medial side a stabilization uh, function, but basically it distributes your weight. This is nicely explained on the slides. It transmits the load vertically from the femur, and you want to load the tibia, and in between is this cushion that is uh, very strongly anchored to the bone. And once you have an injury, you lose the tissue, and this is what you see on the right. And by losing the tissue, you have these red areas that appear on the cartilage. And that's why a knee starts wearing down once the meniscus is lost. So onset of arthritis starts very often with a meniscus injury. It's basically, we should talk not about arthritis, which focuses on the cartilage, but basically it's meniscus arthritis because most of the arthritis that we see the arthrosis that we see, the cartilage wear that we see, uh, actually starts by wearing arch or uh, medial or your 
lateral meniscus. It creates pink forces, which you can see here on the right. That's those red areas, and that's when your cartilage starts to wear out. So what we want to do is we want to be, uh, be ahead of the game and actually prevent uh, the wearing of the cartilage by substituting the lost tissue with some new tissue or an implant. A damaged meniscus has very limited healing potential. That is basically the reason why we need to take very often pieces out. The meniscus is avascular. It has very small vascular elements, especially on the medial side. It has a very purely vascular supply. Two-thirds of the meniscus, mainly the inner part, don't have any vessels in there. So once it's torn, it will remain torn and it will cause damage very often uh, to the cartilage. And that's why we need to do so many uh, uh, meniscectomies and so many operations on those menisci because they basically don't the ones that are injured. The current treatments options that we have today, however, also do have downsides. Very often, this is, this is nicely explained on this slide, is once you start having a meniscus injury, the ship starts to make water. And the end result is arthritis in the long term. That's what you see. And basically, meniscus injury very often ends up with a partial meniscectomy. And a partial meniscectomy will end up with a total or unicompartmental knee replacement. And that's what you see here. If you have a partial meniscectomy, the you have a risk increase by a tenfold for a knee replacement. If, you see, if you're a young patient, so if the disease starts early and you have to perform a meniscectomy in these young patients, your risk for ending up with a knee replacement basically increases by 40 times. And in England, 15 years after partial meniscectomy, and maybe 20 years after your original injury to the meniscus, 13.5% of these patients had a knee replacement. So if you're 20, you basically start running into trouble early on. The disease starts very often in 40s to 50s, but then already at the age of 60, many of these patients are facing knee arthroplasty as a solution. And the, in the place where I work, the average age for a total knee arthroplasty is 67. But there is a significant part of my patients that come in with a need for arthroplasty because of the typical story, meniscus injury, partial meniscectomy, advanced wear of the cartilage, need for total knee uh, replacement. And that story starts at the age of 30 or 40. And so they end up 20 years later with already advanced cartilage wear. And so we want to have a solution for those patients earlier on, basically to prevent the need for knee replacement or to delay that need for knee replacement because we also know that knee replacement patients don't do very well when they're very young. So um, substitution, um, if you're a young patient, meaning you have high healing potential, your cells are still active, you can do an allograft, which is a donor meniscus, you can do a scaffold, which is a synthetic substitute that allows your body to heal and grow into the substitute. So these are biological options and those are aiming for younger patients. And younger uh, actually means below the age of 40. That's the ideal indication for a biological solution. If you smoke, if you have diabetes, even at the age of 40, your biological healing potential already is reduced. And so we might need to do another option for these patients. Many patients, I think every patient, wants to avoid or delay knee replacement. I have never seen in my practice, I do about 250 total knees per year. I've never seen a patient walking in and saying, I'm, going to, I'm happy because I get a total knee replacement. Basically, they're happy if they have a solution for their pain but nobody's really, really happy with a knee replacement. What we want to do is delay the need or avoid the need for a re knee replacement. Avoid the need to be to have um, cutting out pieces of your bone, pieces of your 
documents, pieces of cartilage, and replacing them with metal and plastic. We want to basically uh, uh, save that joint for a total knee replacement. In this uh, schematic, you see the ladder that Tim uh, nicely introduced to you. At the age of 30 to 40, we can still have some limitations of activities, some medications, some bracing, physical rehab, weight loss. Those are essential bits in the treatment for meniscus loss. If you're overweight, you need to reduce the weight because that's basically the driving force for degeneration very often in a number of these patients. You can inject hyaluronic acid, cortisone, maize and some stem cells. You can repair, you can do with a simple meniscectomy and you can substitute with a biological solution being the allograft or the scaffold up to that age of 40 maybe 45 50. but then there's a big gap between the 40 the 50 to 60 years that's where we see patients struggling they're either too young for knee replacement but they're too old for having this biological solution and so that's where we struggle as physicians and that's where we're happy that tonight we can discuss this newer option that basically really nicely fits into the patient population saying the 45 40 45 year old up to 60 65. you can also change the knee joint and the architecture of the knee joint if you're in virus if you have bow legs or knock knees you can straighten the legs that's what we call an osteotomy or you can start cutting out pieces of bone and ligaments and cartilage and meniscus and that's what we call the arthroplasty. We know that once you're in the arthroplasty world, there's no way back. So if you fail your first arthroplasty, you want to have a bigger one and bigger one and bigger one. So the surgery always gets more complicated once you start in the arthroplasty. So that's why we really want to avoid arthroplasty in patients, especially younger than 50. And ideally, the, the average is, as I told you, is in, uh, in, uh, in Belgium, is 67. So the solution is this uh, new surface uh, meniscus replacement. It has benefits, uh, meaning that it's aimed to relieve pain, improve and increase your physical activity, because what you see when you start having an injury to the knee is basically two things. You start seeing that these patients suffer, but also that they start having limitations in their daily activities. And so we want to improve the pain, improve the pain and also improve your physical activity uh, level. You want to improve quality of life and still you want to have main, those treatment options that you might need in the future, not in the future. So you want to maintain future treatment options. If you start doing osteotomies or other surgeries, you change the architecture of the knee and you potentially complicate other surgeries later on. If you start doing with a, a compartmental knee arthroplasty, we all know that once you start cutting away bone, there's no alternative but to enlarge and deepen the arthroplasty, meaning bigger prosthesis all the time. What we see with this new surface device is that you can change this if necessary, a number of times when I do have patients that came back uh, uh, for a new new surface device, and you can exchange it a number of times in, in these patients uh, without uh, expanding or deepening or uh, changing that knee architecture. You just put it in the same device for a second or a third time. You can consider this as being the tire, the tire on your car, which you can exchange and still the car keeps driving. It might be a old car, but it keeps driving on this new wheel. And that's um, the, uh, the principle behind this type of uh, implant. So the meniscus replacement using the new surface nicely covers that age group, 45 to 65, where you want to avoid uh, the need for total knee arthroplasty. You want to avoid starting to uh, cut into the bone. Um, there are other options. Um, if you have a meniscectomy, and if you have a meniscectomy that keeps on causing pain to the patient, uh, you can go on the left, you see hyaluronic acid injections, meniscectomies, 
allograft uh, transplantation. You can see that the new surface device, which is the second slide uh, on your left, doesn't change the architecture. You don't change anything to the bone. You basically pop in a new meniscus device on the medial side. And then from there, you can see that there are other options. Uh, there are considered more classic options. Osteotomy is a great option, but you change the architecture of the knee. That's the first, that's the, the, the fourth line here. I don't know if you see my corner, but that uh, that shows you the osteotomy, which is a joint changing uh, uh, surgery. This is a more experimental device, which is basically a spring that can implant between femur and tibia. But these are the well-known arthroplasties, either medial unicompartmental prosthesis, which is cutting away part of the bone uh, and it, uh, substituting that with metal and plastic. You have unicompartmental prosthesis, you have the total prosthesis, and you have the revision. And if you start very early on with a unicompartmental prosthesis, almost all of these patients will end up with a total, and the total will end up with a revision if you're young. And so you want to delay that story of arthroplasty as long as possible, but still maintaining a high quality of life, a high function, and low pain. That's basically the goal of the surgery. Each of the surgery that you see here on this slide, that's the goal. So how does it work? As I told you before, uh, normal meniscus distributes the weight. It's a weight-bearing cushion in between femur and tibia. If it's torn, you lose that cushion function and you get an increase of the stress on the cartilage. A number of patients will have a partial meniscectomy. A number of them will have a more extensive meniscectomy because the disease, the degeneration of the meniscus was extensive. Therefore, we need to uh, take out a bigger part of the uh, meniscus. And about 5 to 10 percent of these patients will end up with what we call a post meniscectomy syndrome, which is remaining pain on the medial side of the knee, even if your legs are normally aligned, even if you're athletically built, no obesity. Some of these patients end up in trouble. And in those patients, you want to substitute that lost tissue with this new surface device. And you want to have no longer those red areas, which you see in the middle, those red areas you want to avoid. And what you see on the right is that everything turns blue again, because you now have this cushion in between femur and tibia, which is almost anatomically shaped. It's a floating device. So you just prop it in into the medial compartment, and you restore pressure on the cartilage and therefore you restore function, you decrease pain and you most likely also will delay the onset of further treatment options being arthroplasty, unicompartmental arthroplasty. New surface procedure overview, it's a very easy and straightforward uh, uh, procedure. It's generally well tolerated. Most of these patients uh, will First of all, have an MRI. That MRI is assessed by an expert. Sometimes there's a small osteophyte or some uh, issues that we need to cover as a surgeon. So if you want to come and see us for this type of procedure, please have an MRI available of the knee. We will also need x-rays. And ideally, we want to have a full leg x-ray also of the knee. The surgery is performed in less than an hour. It uh, uh, needs an arthroscopy where we clean the remaining parts of the meniscus, where we check the anatomy, where we check the cartilage, so we repair the joint, and then with a mini arthrotomy, a mini incision of about four to six centimeters, depending on your size, we will open up the knee joint on the medial side, and we will basically plug in the uh, new surface implant, which already has been sized on your MRI. That's why it's so important to have that MRI available. Sizing is done on the MRI, so we are sure the correct size goes in, into your knee. And then we test the knee by flexion and extension. We test the stability. We test for any impingement in any reg uh, re uh, region of the knee. And we want to uh, have a full, nicely function 
functioning stable knee joint at the end of the procedure. All of this takes about 60 minutes and it's pretty straightforward. There's no uh, uh, advanced technical skills necessary to perform the surgery. This is a video and Sheila, can you or Richard, can you play the video? This video shows you the situation of somebody with a torn meniscus. Uh, where previously or during the surgery, the surgeon will take out the remaining bits that are torn. We want to keep the outer rim of the meniscus uh, there because it stabilizes that implant. And then you basically plug in this floating. It's not fixed. It, it, it sticks in between the femur and the tibia, and it's stabilized by that rim. You want to plug in that correctly sized implant on the medial compartment and restore the function and the anatomy on the medial compartment. We can also check that during the surgery. Um, if you can show me the next slide. During the surgery, uh, we have a trial implant and then a final implant. And here you can see the trial implant where the surgeon basically extends and flexes the knee. So we can see that this implant is stable on the tibia and follows the function and follows the, the form of the medial femoral canal. We can also assess sizing, correct sizing, and stability. So this is a typical MRI. And so the follow-up of these patients is, you can have an X-ray, but you won't see anything on the X-ray because the, it's plastic. The, it's uh, completely invisible on an X-ray. So the, in, that's why we take uh, very often as a follow-up tool, as a means of assessing these patients, how they function and how the cartilage is behaving. We will do an MRI. You can nicely see on the left that black implant in between the femur and the tibia. You can see the nice fit between the tibia and the femur and how this new implant uh, takes the load from the femur and puts it nicely on the tibia. And on the right, you see an intact knee. The difference between the left and the right is that in the middle, there's some tissue there. There's some implant there. So the implant is not an open uh, O shape. It is a circular shape. And so also in the middle, there is some uh, meniscus implant or meniscus device tissue there. That's the only difference that you will have between a new surface implant and the MRI. And so the keen eye will observe the difference. Um, I'm not sure what was supposed to be here because we did have some uh, very nice data. I think on the slide shows data from uh, the large uh, US study where we compare the meniscus implant patients with patients that have been treated conservatively uh, using the brace, the injections, the physical therapy, the weight reduction programs. So we compare these two groups and what do we see is that if you have pain after a partial meniscectomy and you have conservative therapy, most of these patients will improve by maybe five to 10 points. If you have the implant, and you have the same issues with your knee, you have the post meniscectomy issue, pain after a meniscectomy, and you do an implant. In that group, most of the patients, and I'm talking about 75 to 80% of the patients, will improve more than 20 points on the coup scale. So five points on the, uh, five to 10 points on the conservative therapy with 20 points or more on the uh, treatment group. So that is a significant difference. We see that difference appearing already pretty early on when you start the treatment. After six months, the patients really start seeing a difference between the conservative therapy group and the implant group. And that difference remains stable over time. So the uh, non-surgically treated group show that those, uh, those scores improved slightly and then had a tendency to go down while the implant group remains stable over time. And that's a randomized trial in the US 
publications or data are now sent to the FDA and are under evaluation, but those are very convincing data that substituting lost meniscus tissue with a meniscus implant uh, uh, as the new surface really makes sense for most of these patients. What to expect after surgery? Basically, if you have surgery, we have is part of the deal. That's uh, you can't just walk home and you need to do the rehab, but the rehab is quite short. You can immediately start weight bearing on the implant. You start doing motions like cycling, uh, uh, moving the knee around, walking around, and we advise patients to wear a brace as some kind of protection um, of the joint in the first week. Uh, meniscus replacement offers an alternative treatment for knee pain because uh, it will delay the need for basically cutting into the bone and cutting away uh, uh, parts of the, the knee. The implant is just doing that simple surgery of implanting or exchanging, substituting uh, lost tissue where in the knee replacement uh, surgery you really start taking pieces out of the knee joint. So it delays knee replacement surgery. It does offer uh, pain relief and by relieving the pain you see these patients increasing their physical activity during daily activi activities of daily life. There's a swift and brief post-operative recovery period and what I told you earlier, uh, this is one of those unique features of this implant, uh, making the, uh, the uh, comparison with the cars or the tires of your car, it can be replaced and it will be replaced with the same device. And this does not uh, endanger any future uh, treatment options. So you do not have to, once the surgery model, fails for any reason or the implant fails, you can easily exchange it for a new implant. You do not endanger any future uh, treatment options because you don't change the knee joint. You didn't cut pieces away of the knee. And that's a, a real uh, change in paradigm for uh, treating this uh, rather young patient population. So with this, I would like to thank you. I've seen there's a, a number of uh, questions out there. I don't know if Tim's around still, but I will now hand over back to Richard, and we can start having questions. Um, yes. So, so thank you very much both. Peter, we can't see you, um, which is always a pity. You, can you turn your um, webcam on? Let's see if you can get you on there as well. Wait, I'll. Okay. Does that work? I think you're coming. Yeah. Yes, there you are. There you are. Very good. Okay. So, um, Tim, would you have any questions for Peter following that presentation? Or shall we go straight through to the audience? No, I think that was a really good um, outline. And the whole point is where this treatment option can fit into the scale of the options that we have. And that I think has been a, a theme of our of the introduction and the main bit, understanding where this can fit, because everyone's got their range of problems as you'll see in the in the questions. So yes, do start with some of those questions. Okay. Well, well perhaps we can start at the um, earlier stage because you've articulated a range of solutions that can fit in with different stages of people's progression. So um, an early question from Debbie was about glucosamine supplements and, and whether there's any um, data around that, whether there's any evidence that glucosamine can be an effective um, supplement to take. Yeah, I personally think these do have a role in treatment. They, the, the evidence behind them is the scientific part is, is weak because they're not necessarily studied like a, like a drug would be studied. But we definitely see patients who certainly attribute their improvement to the use of glucosamine. So I think they're another strategy and they help with the whole of the overall aspects of controlling eating and using the supplements. So I think they do have a role. There's a, there, there's a small measured benefit from them. Okay. Um, just okay. maybe a, a remark, Richard, or just a, a, an addition to that. Most of the patients that we treat surgically will 
have had previous conservative therapy. I think the central uh, answer is that you cannot rush into surgery without having conservative therapy. And I think that's very important to understand as a patient is that we don't rush, uh, at least I don't, and I don't think Tim rushes into surgery with substitution. Substitution is done in patients that fail conservative therapy. Okay, well that, that links in, in well with a um, question from uh, Paris, which was about the type of brace that would be used. I'm not sure if this would be specifically for a new surface brace or, or, or in general for meniscus damage, but w would you use an offloading brace or a common range of motion yeah. brace? Many uh, of what is an offloading brace? That's what it's... Many of my patients that come in with issues after meniscectomy, so that's already a subgroup of the dual group, uh, part of them will be treated with an unloader brace to see if the pain comes from overloading the, of the medial compartment. And so only a few of these patients will be happy wearing the brace for the rest of their life. But bracing them does offer me insight into where the pathology comes from. Is it a loading issue? And if it's a confirmed loading issue, then I can tell, I can talk these patients through uh, substitution of tissue using an the scaffold or uh, the device, depending on their age and their general condition. I use always an unloader, an medial unloader brace, and I'm pretty happy with them. So these braces then, by, by the straps and the force through them, then shift the weight more from one side of the knee, recognizing we've seen there are two halves to the knee, then shifting the weight from the overloaded medial or inner half of the knee, more central and more towards the lateral. So it reduces those peak forces. But that's what we're dealing with, pain on that inner medial side of the knee. But the brace, I think, is a really good option. And you can use it in the gym or go walking, working with it, and then don't need it around the house. So the act is partly, yes, as a predictor of good outcome because the unloading effect can help. So this is um, a common strategy to use. Right. And then um, staying on the, the early stage of this process um are there meniscus injuries that require particularly urgent operative management um and uh when a, a patient has damaged their meniscus and, and they're faced with a question over repairing that that damage or, or accepting cutting away that damage how much should a patient try to go for the repair option you know are there times where that's just really not a possibility and, and would most surgeons try to repair a meniscus if they can? Yeah, that's a very good good question. Not not every meniscus tear is repairable. The meniscus itself does not have a good blood supply. When we talk about the, the uh, periphery, the rim of the meniscus, which is attached to the capsule around the knee, that part has a good blood supply. So if the meniscus comes away from the edge and then jams in the knee, then that type of meniscus tear could be put back in the right place and stitches to hold it in place. But if it's a small flap of the meniscus that's getting in the way, then that won't, won't heal and is not, not repairable at all. And then you're only losing a small part of it that wasn't doing very much. So in that sense, a smaller tear is okay. But a large tear that's jamming the knee and stopping it moving, our so-called lock knee, then those um, tears should try to be, uh, should be repaired. Um, if, if possible, to hold it in place. Um, so it's a question here from Pietro uh, Mazzarello. Mazzarello, sorry, Pietro. Um, if someone has a meniscus injury that's that's developing pain, but there's no mechanical symptoms, and perhaps you can explain what a mechanical symptom is, would you still go through it for an operative route? And, and if you didn't go for an operation and went that more conservative treatment, what was the so this has been a, uh, a big thing the last couple of years is a, a kind of a shift in the practice of many surgeons. However, I don't think I changed my practice that much over the years. Every knee that comes in or every meniscus tear in the middle aged patient population being 40 and up um, uh, gets 
a conservative therapy as a first-line treatment in my practice. Again, I, I think very clearly, we don't rush into surgery unless there is a lock knee, and the lock knee is that mechanical center. Unless there is a clear click in that knee that might cause damage to the opposing cartilage. Other, uh, uh, besides those clear issues of, of mechanical disruption, you want to treat or you want to keep as much of the meniscus tissue inside the knee all the time. So many of the patients that I treat will, firstly, when they present, they don't have any imaging available, they will get a shot of cortisone very often. I will send them off to the MRI. And I think 50 to 60% when they come back six weeks later with the shot and the physical therapy will come in and they say, Doc, I'm better. And then we document the fact that they had a torn meniscus but that is treated conservatively. And most of these patients will do fine for many years. However, I always tell them that most likely some of them will come back because they have remaining pain that now no longer reacts to any conservative therapy. Those are the ones where I perform a partial mastectomy. If the pain is, uh, is uh, resistant to any conservative therapy, and we're talking the middle age patient population, I'm not talking the soccer player that tears the meniscus and needs surgery. That's a different population, that's a traumatic. But many normal patients come in and they have this cascade of conservative therapy, injection, diagnosis, uh, most often uh, have a happy life, even with a tear. The, a minority will still have issues, painful, and need mastectomy. And of that group, after mastectomy, in my hands, about 5 to 10%. And we do now know which factors basically will accelerate the disease or which are risk factors but then it's a minority, those will need uh, further surgery, further therapy. Yeah, I think there are definitely, as you say, certain patterns of meniscus tear that don't seem to get better so quickly. There's a, a, if the part of the meniscus um, gets torn and jams in the wrong place, then those are ones that are not going to get better, or we can have a, a, a flap of the meniscus getting pushed down that, that, that tenses the ligament or gets a good puts pressure on the ligament around the knee, those don't get better so quickly. So our a period of waiting, I agree with you, it's sort of that three months of time trying to let things settle. And then if there's still mechanical catching pains, then that unit of time is probably long enough to be, to be waiting. So we've definitely slowed down a bit, letting knees get better. But um, no, I fully agree with what you say. Right. So, so let's move along from the... Um point of injury and, and the decision on the uh, initial form of treatment. A question here from Geraint, um, and looking at that range of options available from um, you know, repair through to a scaffold through to a replacement. Geraint says, I have significant articular cartilage damage as well as a film of meniscus, which is causing me problems. It's fine to walk, but it's painful to run. What are my options to get back running again, 35 years old? Perhaps we can put that question to Tim. Yeah, so we really need to evaluate the knee and understand where the pain is coming from, whether it's mechanical from the remaining part of the meniscus or whether it's an overload problem on the from the joint surface type pain. And particularly, we would look at the alignment of the leg because if um, if you're bowed and therefore taking more weight on that inner side of the knee, then that could be a factor. And by using an unloading brace, that could be a good option then to reduce the load through the knee. But then it's an MRI scan to understand the state of the joint surface, exactly how worn the knee is, uh, ranging from a small area of thinning of the surface to complete loss of the normal three millimeter, four millimeter layer thick of articular surface, which is a, a, a worse situation to be in. Uh, we then have options, as we said, of the meniscus transplant, putting in a donor meniscus, and there are ways to repair the joint surface in at the age that I think you said 35. This new surface implant is less good in when it's bare bone, so that's an uh, aspect we have to look for as to how worn the knee is, because this implant is there to protect the joint surface, so we need some joint surface still present. 
So hopefully the, the sort of ladder of treatment that we've outlined gives the range of options. And then it's a balance. There's no one right treatment for this. It's a balance of putting things to, to, together. That's my view. Yeah, I fully agree with Tim. Um, I must just add maybe as a clarification, many of the patients when they come and see us, they're scared and they're concerned about the cartilage loss. And they're looking for a cartridge, cartridge solution. But basically the cartilage solution is the meniscus. And so you cannot address that meniscus, that cartilage issue, unless at some point we substitute the meniscus tissue. Uh, that's the best safeguard for your cartilage. And that is something that we learned over the last 10 years. We started focusing on treating all these cartilage issues. We kind of forgot that there was a meniscus, which is way more important in protecting the joint than the cartilage. So if you have a meniscus loss and a cartilage loss, focus first on the meniscus loss and then, and very often you don't even have to, then you can focus on the cartilage loss. But the overall thing before even considering the meniscus is alignment and stability. If you're 35, a number of these patients will have a complex issue, either alignment with severe bow legs or a history of an ACL injury. Um, so these 35 year olds with, with advanced wear and meniscus loss, those are most likely complex cases and that's why we need the MRI, we need the full leg x-ray, we need the normal x-ray, and you need a full detailed uh, history of those patients. Right. But, but there are treatment options available for a 35 year old with damaged meniscus and cartilage that wants to maintain an active. Absolutely. Good. Uh, the, the scaffolds that you mentioned, um, where would be the place for a scaffold in place of a, a meniscus transplant, a donated meniscus? And, and what do you think are the likely outcomes of a scaffold? How long do they last for in, in your experience? So there's there's it's, it's the ideal patient for one of these samples. Yeah. So there's so we have these three solutions uh, for substituting lost meniscus tissue. The scaffolds are aimed for patients that have significant issues, or where the remaining part of the meniscus is still good enough. So the meniscus is not completely gone. They have a segmental defect, and so in those patients you can have a substitution for the segment defect with these scaffolds. Uh, very important to understand is the scaffold allows your body to heal. It's not a substitute and starts functioning directly. It allows your body to heal. Therefore, those patients need a good healing potential. If you're overweight, if you have diabetes, if you smoke, your healing potential decreases. Sometimes even genetically you don't you're not a good healer. And basically in those patients scaffolds don't perform that well. However, if you're a good healer, if you're young, if you have a segmental defect, if the roots are intact, if the rims intact, those are great indications for scaffold. Meniscus allograft is based on our experience so far and we have about 30 years of experience with meniscus allografts. Tim has a huge experience with that type of surgery. With meniscus allografts, is aiming for, again, the younger patient with extensive loss of meniscus tissue. And then the, the new surface is rather aiming for the older patient uh, with also extensive loss, but only on the medial side. We don't have a implant for the lateral side. So for the allograft, we do have implants for, or allografts for medial and lateral. The new surface is only there for the medial side. That's also a big difference. Well, we so keep so coming so back to this sort of the biological bit of this um, age bit of trying to get tissue to heal. And that's our, our problem that over a certain age, then the tissues just don't heal so well. So using the meniscus transplant, the donor meniscus, then there's a, a limit to that biological healing ability. I know it sounds um, odd talking about the exact ages of, of people, but it's a very real aspect to how we manage people from the young 16-year-old to the 40-year-old to the 60-year-old. So, so we have a lot of questions around the new surface um, meniscus replacement, but just um, one, one question before we move on to that 
looking through this progression, and, and Peter, you've touched on this, but there's a big similar conservative treatment. So um, Ahmed um, has, uh, he's 25 uh, years old male. Uh, he had two thirds of his lateral meniscus two and a half years ago playing basketball. And the MRI has shown a, a two square centimeter cartridge defect on the lateral condyle. Uh, the x-ray readings are normal, he says, and he, he doesn't want to make any lifestyle changes as a, a young man. He'd very much like to return to basketball, but he's got conflicting advice from surgeons that he's seen. So it's the one surgeon who said that he looked for meniscus allograft and meniscus transplant as soon as possible. And the other has said that meniscus transplant have too high a failure rate to be useful for it, and that he'd be better off to focus on strengthening the surrounding meniscus getting regular knee injections or PRP or stem cells or, or hyaluronic acid. And so he's a bit confused as to which approach to take. And so I appreciate you don't have um, the general seconds, but just in general, conservative you know, building up the muscles, injections versus going to the of transplant and then throwing into the mix the difficulties to part with the it, it's, it's a very typical patient profile. Is a 25-year-old that hears the meniscus has early onset arthritis in the lateral compartment because of the loss of his meniscus. And then we have this apparent issue on what to do. I don't see any issue. For me, this is a clear answer. If the cartilage wear is secondary to the meniscus loss, it makes all the sense to get a meniscus back into that knee. There is no way that we can salvage this knee joint and every data, every publication, every scientist, every orthopedic surgeon will tell you that this knee will wear out if we just be this conservative. However, meniscus allograft transplantation also requires good muscles. So the investment into physiotherapy is essential. Uh, we need to find a meniscus allograft on the left side, which makes which may take some time, and the injections are supportive therapy, but they will never be the substitute for the meniscus allograft. So on the lateral side, 25 year old, normally aligned, active guy, you want to get a meniscus back into that knee joint as soon as possible. Remind yourself that we do have waiting lists for this type of surgery, and that in the meantime, you need to strengthen the leg because the first shock absorber. The knee is a muscle. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. So, so mo moving on to the new surface implant, perhaps, um, and, and you, you expanded on this in the presentation. But if you could just summarise who you see as the perfect candidate for a new surface implant, um, Peter. Um, so the ideal uh, indication is the fifty-year-old person. Preferably male. Why male? Because often the weight size ratio in males is better. So uh, I do think there's a number of female listeners to this uh, to this uh, webinar. It's important to understand that what we what we call is the men, the weight versus meniscus size issue is an essential driver for arthritis. You can have a big knee and a normal weight, and therefore there's less pressure in that compartment. But if you have a small knee, and we see very often more on the female side, smaller knees, normal issues with normal weight, and they run into trouble a lot sooner. Not because of the weight, because of the size of the bone. So ideally, you have a 50-year-old person with a post-meniscectomy knee, pain on the medial side, damage that is not completely worn out. So we do advise these patients not to wait 10 years after their meniscectomy because in, after 10 years, most likely your joint will be changed a little bit. It will become flatter. There's going to be cartilage loss. And you just complicate the solution of meniscus substitution. So. 50 year old, rim intact, limited cartilage wear, but we can go up to grade three or even focal grade four. Moderately active. If you're a marathon runner, 
a meniscus substitution, either out of graft, scaffold, new surface, will never be able to resist the forces that are posed on the knee joint while you're running a marathon. So moderate activity level is what we're aiming for. That means the jogging, cycling, uh, fitness. You don't want to run 20 k's. If you're coming to my office and you tell me, well, and my ambition is to go back to running 20 k's, and then I go, then I'm going to be realistic and say, I advise against long and uh, uh, big time impact sports. So that's my patient profile ideal and normally aligned. You want to have three legs. You don't want to have both legs. What I liked in your talk, Peter, was this concept of the, this gap in treatment before getting to knee replacement and these options. We just didn't really have these options before to try and handle this 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 problem that, that we're now trying to address. So that's what I, uh, you know, I, that's what I see where the new surface is in this bit. The 50 year old male ideal right in the middle of that group and around that there are then others suffering with this um, in this gap of treatment where we could do meniscus transplant in the biologically younger or under 45, under 50, um, uh, those options, but it's this gap of treatment. So that's what I like about the new surface. And, and the goal of, of this treatment and all of these treatments is to, to delay or, or hopefully avoid a, a knee replacement or at least delay it to an appropriate time. If you see that ideal patient um, for the new surface, they walk into your clinic, what would you say to them in terms of the realistic expectation? How long will it last for? Um, and uh, if they're 50 years old, will, is it going to prevent need for knee replacement in the future? I think I'm, I'm more thinking of this as buying time and quality of life. So the knee may still wear, but the lifestyle is better and symptoms are less during that time period. So you've got that cushion in the knee to be able to keep the knee going. To prove that it completely delays and prevents knee replacement, that's a tougher ask because patients are going to be more active with it. So for me, it's about that quality of life toning down some of the expectations so patients can still stay active and enjoy things, but not that running 20K as, um, as Peter just, just mentioned. And to give an exact number of how long it'll, how many years, how, how long it'll delay things, that's always um, a very difficult thing to answer, but it's that buying time, quality of life aspect that I would focus on. Yeah, would you agree with that, Peter? Yes, absolutely. Um, some observations is that for meniscus allograft, because now we, we can go back 30 years already with this kind of science, we know that most of these patients, 80% will perform still pretty well at 10 years and about maybe 50% at, uh, at, at 20 years. But on the other side, if you see these knees, very often they fail by wearing out progressively the cartilage and by progressive degeneration arthritis. The new surface is, in my observations, different. If we see wear and tear, it's not going to be the cartilage. I think it's very uh, powerful in protecting the cartilage, but the implant might suffer. It's also synthetic, meaning it, it can break down. And if you're, con if you're confronted with a breakage of the implant, you just take it out and put a new one in. My meniscus allograft patients, it's very rare that I take it out and I put a new one back in. With this implant, I do that uh, 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 more often. So there's a different way of failure in these uh, joints. And if I can put a number on the surface age uh, or the range or what we want to achieve, is we want to achieve five to 10 years with a single implant. But if the implant fails, and that's my experience so far, most of these patients, I'll take it out and I'll do a new one. And so you can pre uh, preserve that knee joint in its normal architecture. And most of the times, the cartilage at the time of the failure will be identical to the original surgery. That will rarely be the case for a meniscus allograft. So, so it's the uh, it's the implant that wears, not the cartilage. Exactly. You can replace the implant, but you can't replace the cartilage very easily. But again, the science is less mature 
We have now about 10 years of experience with the uh, surface device in, under really regulated clinical research circumstances. We have 30 years of, uh, of background on meniscus allografts. We, we are much wiser on the meniscus allograft. But from that 10 years of experience, uh, I started doing the surgery uh, with the surface uh, uh, quite a number of years, I think more than 10 years now. We do have good evidence that it provides pain relief and gets you back to that quality of life uh, with moderate activities for a longer period. And even if it fails, you can replace it. And it, this is the first treatment ever in my uh, uh, clinical experience where I can repeat the same surgery without any of the downsides. Normally in orthopedics, if you have to do a repeat a surgery, either in ACL or total knee prosthesis, it becomes more complex the second time around. With this, it doesn't become more complex, it's basically easier. And also for the patients, the rehab is, is easier because the joint is already shaped to the implant. And that's a very interesting observation, but we need more experience, of course, as we go. Is there a risk of the body rejecting the implant? And is there a risk of the implant dislocating? And if, if so, what's the rate of dislocations that people have seen so far? And perhaps you could explain what dislocation means. So uh, we haven't seen, uh, I'm going back now 10 years. Uh, so this uh, implant is made out of polyurethane, which is one of the most inert plastic plastics around. We have never seen any biological reaction to the implant or debris caused by the implant, secondary uh, particles that cause some biological reaction. So it's completely inert. Even if there's debris, your body doesn't react to it. So there's no rejection to the implant. If you have an issue and the implant breaks, very often it will remain in place and the patients will feel a pop and they will suddenly be back to that original situation with no meniscus anymore. It happens in a second. And they can basically, they can feel it. If that happens, you have to go and see your surgeon. I've never seen a patient that never had that situation on a second. They can basically feel the loss of the meniscus when the implant fails and then it ruptures. In some of these patients, that happens during a violent mo motion and then the implant can dislocate, move out of its original position and become dislocated in the back or in the front of the knee. And then the patient will have a locking sensation with the pain. In that case, you have to take it out. The complication rates are pretty low. Uh, dislocation rate is below 5%. And there are a number of ruptures of implants once you get older. And that's why we're doing all these studies. So if you wait long enough, I think all of these implants will have some kind of failure where they break and need to be exchanged. It's going to be five years, 10 years, 20 years. I have patients basically running around with implants over now, I think, eight or nine years. But I see some early breakage also. And if they break early on, it might most likely be, be caused by uh, either the surgeon. I wasn't careful enough and I had some impingements. And what we learned over the years is that you really need to be careful in getting all of the impingement areas addressed during the arthroscopy. And that's why the MRI is so important. Because nowadays you get information from the company telling you, be careful there, watch out this. That's a potential issue. So you can address them during the arthroscopy. Yeah. Uh, so, so some questions on, on this practicalities of receiving treatment with new surface. Uh, question from Patrick. Um, is, is the actual procedure itself um, requiring an overnight stay for the patient or can they be operated on on an ambulatory basis? And another question, um, recognizing that, that you offer this treatment, um, first of all, don't, but uh, Tim Spalding, do you, do you offer this treatment? And patients in the UK, what's the um, recommended way to, to get to see somebody based on the fact that we've got this, this panel of surgeons? So two questions, yeah. inpatient yeah. or outpatient? 
we've been watching the, the data and it's now available in UK. It's a, a recent option for us. And I think at the end of the uh, session, you will have a list of those surgeons that are now offering that, that treatment and we'll keep an eye on the results to match the uh, European series as, as well. And it could be day case or, or overnight stay. I, I, I must admit I'm more with the meniscus transplant, for example, similar to that one night stay. So there's a personal choice aspect to that in UK, much more in the way of one night stay. So I think that would be the anticipated event before leaving hospital on, on the crutches. But yes, it, it is available in UK. Uh, last question, because I think we've covered most of them. Um, from Jerome, with providing the better displacement of force across the joint space with new surface, is one of the themes to allow the subchondral bone to catch up with the healing from the previous focal load? I suppose it's asking whether the cartilage might, in fact, it's rather place. I couldn't quite see the question, but whether it's whether the articular cartilage, I think if I heard you right, is going to repair itself around the implant, I'm not sure that's the uh, aim, but we know a lot of the pain comes from the subchondral bone. So by redistributing the load, then there's less force on that. So that's partly how it's how it's helping by reducing that peak force and the pressure pain. Uh, so I think that load distribution is a key part to it. So, so on behalf of um, Niguru, myself, and, and all of the audience, thank you so much to the pair of you for, for passing up your time, and thank you to all the audience members as well for um, coming to join us. We look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for hosting us and thank you for that. Thank you, Richard. Very nice. Thank you, Tim. And thank you, Sheila.